Welcome to the School of Calisthenics podcast with your hosts, Tim and Jacko. Another week, another podcast, and today you are in the illustrious company of Tim and Jacko from the School of Calisthenics podcast because there is no guest. We don't need a guest. We are talking about getting insane gains, and I know somebody that's got some insane information to drop for you uh, today in this podcast, and that is our good friend, aka Timbo. But before we just jump into that, um, something else that's insane or where people are a bit unsure about is... Um, are we in lockdown, aren't we in lockdown, and, 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 all, and all that confusion. But there's something not to be confused about is the fact that we are still keeping our 50% offer um, off your first month's membership for the virtual classroom uh, open this whole entire time until there is some clarity on when lockdown is actually finished. Is that right, Tim? Yeah, I'm just a little bit confused as to why you've uh, how you've snuck insane gains into the intro for the podcast this week. <laughs> But we're not going to go into too much detail with this one. It's all talked about in the session. We go to quite a little bit of um, a practical takeaways on this one is how you can start to structure your training to get a little bit more fun and get a bit more variety and particularly around some hypertrophy. So if you're looking to build some muscle mass so you can do some more cool stuff, this is the podcast episode for you. And it's direct from some of the things that we are currently doing ourselves in our own training. Hey. Absolutely. And if you also, we have to say a big thank you to the guys at Red Light Rising for sponsoring the School of Calisthenics podcast. They're absolute legends. You can find out a load of information about the benefits of red light therapy at redlightrising.co.uk. And now, Jacko, shall I tell you a little bit about my red light therapy benefits? Tell, tell them about what you've been feeling consistently using it morning and night. <laughs> so the biggest thing, and this is... Um, no, it doesn't come as a surprise, but you know, sometimes when you try something new, you don't really know how it's going to work or how you're going to feel. So if I, in terms of sleep, if I get my bedtime routine right and I'm not sort of on my phone and working late and then I'm using the red light before bed, there has been a consistent increase in my quality of sleep as a result. Not every night because sometimes I don't get my bed, bedtime routine right, but noticeably on some occasions having deeper and better quality sleep than I have been doing previously. And that's me, N of one useful to share these little case studies i reckon well n of two i can say the exact same thing the uh, the, the the science and the, all the research that you can find out about on the on the red light rising website backs up why that is the case it doesn't affect our circadian rhythm um uh, like the like blue light does coming from your phone and, and computer that's why you shouldn't be you on your phone and your computer before you go to bed timbo um and yeah no, there's a whole host of other benefits in terms of recovery and um and all sorts so if you are interested in joining us in the getting involved with some red light therapy, they've got a 5% offer uh, off any of their red light rising products on uh, on their website. So that is using code SOC5, code SOC5 to get 5% off at redlightrising.co.uk. The link is in the uh, show notes for this episode. I can also confirm that red lights are extremely popular with three-year-olds. Jack loves the red light thinks it's a party <laughs> mrs jacko even likes it crikey There's i've never found reason. anything for that she likes exactly <laughs> it must be good right let's get into some t- some chat about volume and some exciting okay. things about programming variables roll the jingle all right jacko you're sitting comfortably I'm actually, I've got a standing desk, Tim, but yeah, I know what you mean. Yeah, I'm comfy. I am also standing comfortably. Let's begin talking about volume in a training program. Yes, please. Can we, can we talk about, do you want to talk, can we set the scene a little bit of around um, what you've, what we've been doing or what you've been doing and what that looks like in terms of training at home? Please do. Recently. Yeah. Um, well, okay. I'll, I'll just from. You go first. We, we, I think just naturally the way, um, lockdown has been and and what training at home has looked at i i don't know what your i haven't really necessarily asked you specifically your take on it but i definitely took a case of um well i had a shoulder problem um a potentially um long uh i had a little had a um an ultrasound for me in horsley on it and he was like rummaging around in a shoulder that it was my you know my old classic rugby shoulder um that I dislocated and, and and broke the shoulder blade and whatnot and it was like oh yeah I can there's a few tears in here and there was like labrum and then there was like but he reckoned he'd found there was he'd found something subscap and lat like a little small tear so I knew I needed to like chill out a little bit and when I got back into sort of lockdown seemed to happen a couple of weeks after that and I'd just been like resting up a bit 
not doing too much and then just starting back with some like easy volume stuff um and just trying to do a little bit more um of that and then we had andrew tracy on the podcast and whenever we have someone on the podcast that sort of like inspires me and gets me excited i like to try out what they're what they were doing it was like when we had uh, ross edgley on the podcast way back when he made me feel like just by talking to him, he made me feel like I could be a superhuman like him and just do like insane training. And I tried for like two days in a row and then I was like dead. But, um, with Andrew Trace, his idea of like something, he, when he, he said something is better than nothing. And had these like five minute, 10 minute, 20 minute workouts that you could just do what well, he was doing. He'd just do them anywhere in a, in a car park or whatever, but thinking, yeah, I could do that at home. And, and you, you mentioned it when you said sort of at the end of a day, when you don't feel like training, but if you say to yourself, I'll oh, just do 15 minutes, just do like, or just do 10 sets of minute on and, and you, and you just, you just go, yeah, you know, I could do that actually. And then you just keep, pick a couple of simple exercises, just super, all I started doing was just super set and a couple of different exercises, like on the minutes, some, some sort of EMOM style ones like that. And actually just really, really, uh, really enjoyed them recently. And, um, helping with conditioning but also just enjoyment of training not having to think too much about your training and then when i've gone back recently to just like a couple of sessions of like trying some harder stuff i've just laid a bit of a better foundation i think um of that sort of strength and body's feeling good for it nice i my kind of story around getting into a bit more of this is that this is my first um scientific term that i'm going to drop today jacko um oh. it's all around um mojo um so i've had <laughs> is my that mojo, scientific? it is yeah you can look it up um my mojo um which can be defined as one's desire to want to train um yeah. has been fairly low um during lockdown because of just a number of things which uh, life is just busy and there's a lot going on and getting to the end of the day and just being pretty shattered um, so I kind of started just reviewing what I wanted to do with, with training, how I was going to get my mojo back. And I was coming into a session, not really feeling like I wanted to do stuff, which was difficult and like sort of task focused in terms of a specific outcome. And I just wanted to train. Um, and I wanted to play around with something a little bit different. Um, and the other thing is like lockdown and, and training at home actually lends it quite itself quite well when you want to just get some work done and put some reps in the bank of like focusing on what we would normally term capacity strength. Um, because you can use quite simple movements. You can use, you can keep it, you don't need lots of kit to be able to do it. And you can get really significant gains. And, and just from a, a sort of a, a, a Did big you just say gains? Yeah, but not insane gains. Uh, so okay. it's okay. <laughs> um, <laughs> it, it comes down to a bit of like some a hypertrophy adaptation. So we're starting, for me, starting to do a little bit more work, which is going to build some muscle mass because bigger muscles produce more force. And obviously in, in Kyle's sense, we talk about this a lot that we don't necessarily want to increase a huge amount of body mass in terms of weight, but there's going to be a trade-off in terms of being able to produce more force as a result of having more contractile elements in a muscle and therefore be able to do more cool stuff. So I started playing around with some, some different reps and set variables that I used in training programs over the years, mixing it up uh, and just challenging myself in a different way around volume, like German volume training, 10 sets of 10 on pipe push-ups, feet and hands elevated. Like I haven't, and getting into that i haven't got into that sorry for 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 years um and then starting to just explore for my own sort of like accountability around rest periods and tempo particularly of those acute variables of rep sets intensity um tempo and rest because i've kind of had a, a niggle for a while that i don't think i am disciplined enough when i train I don't think a lot of people are disciplined enough when they train around tempo specifically. Mm. And it's such a big driver um, in adaptation, particularly in hypertrophy. And I wanted to kind of put myself through the mill a little bit and see if I could um, be a little bit stricter with myself and, and what it feels like to do that kind of volume with that kind of discipline. Yeah. But do, you know, um, you know, so I was going to ask you when, when you say, Nick, do you mean, um, how was your shoulder pain? Good. Um, it's had some ups and downs in terms of like... Because that was like back. Christmas. It was, after, it was like January, wasn't it? Yeah, it probably wasn't good until the start of lockdown. And then I didn't train again very consistently. So it got some additional rest. Um, but it, off the back of that, being a little bit more conscious, I did a lot of like rehab type work on it. Yeah. And then I haven't actually, if I'm being perfectly honest, done a lot of rehab on it since lockdown started but i've been putting a, a ridiculous amount of volume through it compared yeah. to what i've done previously and it's holding up really well yeah but like good um, volume not just like thrashing it on and i guess yeah. i'm asking like live now on the podcast as a genuine question because you haven't mentioned it like i haven't heard you mention it for yeah 
like say begin a lot of it so maybe seven weeks or, or more so yeah. when someone's not talking about something hurting you tend to think that it's obviously doing all right yeah no, it's, it's doing well and i think the other thing is that I've, some of the stuff i've talked about on, on instagram with it is that manipulating the reps and sets rest periods tempos and whatever intensity to make sure that i continue to move well so if, if i'm i'm much more conscious now and i've identified a couple of key positions where i was not helping my shoulder um, yeah. and this is partly because i've got a little bit too much ra- range end positions and i'm not doing like overhead pressing work for example like a pipe push-up i have a tendency to slam it into that end position and it doesn't like you know someone likes to give an example so people can visualize it if people do a snatch um, lots of people will just throw a bar overhead and their shoulder just stops at that end range of movement. And it's like a bit, it's just like it hits a bumper and they just go like, boom, caught my snatch. For me, with my shoulders, what happens is my hand goes too far over the back of my head and the bar then passes my crown of my head and therefore I'm kind of like overflexed and then the bar of the weight behind me. So that's why I kind of stopped snatching a number of years ago. But if I do the same thing in a, in a pipe push-up position, for example, I've got too much range, so I can actually slam into end range further than where I need to go. And I think that's just kind of compressing some tissues. My scap was like scapular uh, human rhythm wasn't great. So now I've identified what the problem was. I've reintegrated it, did some um, corrective work, and now I've put it back into movement patterns. But I'm much more conscious about moving well, and I'm manipulating the intensity of my session to make sure I can prioritize that rather than just absolutely spanking myself, falling apart, getting sweaty and having done a ton of work but move like a toilet for yeah. half the session there will be a lot of people listening now and it's not it's not now is not to go into it for the podcast there'll be go hold on hold on backtrack him backtrack him <laughs> what did you what did you do what was the correct strategy and then how have you integrated it back in but we'll, that, that's another podcast and that's a whole another rehabilitation program but people are like shut up and tell me how to get massive well, but I think but all the people that are, all the people that are currently injured right now are also going, well, well hold on a minute, what was the intervention? What was the creative strategy? Yeah, I had a little bit of help. I've got to give Gemma a shout out and give me some stuff to do. Um, but yeah, yeah no, I'm feeling pretty good. It still niggles a little bit and I need to do a little bit more mobility on it. But it's um, I can generally get through some pretty disgusting volume in a session and it, it hold up without giving me any pain at all. So that's a massive win. If you're not hurting, it's not getting worse. Mm. That's kind of the, the approach I'm taking to it. Right, but let's talk about this. Let's talk about this volume then. What's uh, kick us off? Right. So my adaptation is maybe a little bit different to yours. And I specifically was interested in playing around with, with a hypertrophy adaptation. So my, my objective is to increase the amount of lean muscle mass or contractile muscle mass that I've got, which let's move away from a bodybuilding terminology. I'm not necessarily trying to get bigger, but I just want to have a little bit more capacity at my disposal to be able to produce some force. Um, so generally what happens around that, if you, you, look, you look at the research and the science, there's three sort of propose maybe a fourth one these days based on where current people's ideas and thoughts are method or, or mechanisms as to how we can improve um, muscle mass or we can, how we can ins- uh, elicit hypertrophy so i don't really want to get bogged down in the detail of those today but just so that people are on the same page they are mechanical yeah. tension um metabolic stress and exercise induced muscle damage those are kind of the three mechanisms one thing that's kind of we just need to bear in mind above all of that, and this is where some of the reps and set variations that we've been using are fitting together, is that volume is the number one driver. We need to be able to do more work, which is going to be the key thing, which is going to help us to get an increase in muscle mass. So you get bogged down in the reps and sets. People are like, oh, you do three sets of 10 for, for hypertrophy, don't you? Or four sets of eight. Well, the research actually is sort of steering away from that a little bit because it, it, it sort of is suggesting, and the current thinking is, you can get hypertrophy using weights that are 50% of your one repetition max, which puts you into a category of around 15 to 20 repetitions. Mm. Whereas people would normally go, oh, you're not going to build muscle mass with 20 reps. Well, the research is now suggesting that you can. Yeah. Um, I'll have to pause there, Jacko, in case you had any so, comment on that, tr- that uh, uh, spiel. No, um, I saw I saw something um, actually the other day where there was, it was, um, and it ties in with your, you know, that you've quoted before that like one set of intensity, um, you can maintain strength for X number of weeks, whatever it is. Mm. Um, but it was, it was, it was research saying that like one set of intensity can actually, I think it was like one set of intensity, two, three times a week would elicit like strength gains. It just, it's not to do with hypertrophy. It was just to do with like research showing that actually like the more people are doing like research projects into these things that they're actually mm. finding out stuff that's a little bit potentially countercultural to the old school ways of, um, bodybuilding yeah and Um, i think that's what's interesting is we don't necessarily know what the underlying mechanism is exactly we've got some good ideas from ultimately lots of things work don't they like because not being funny like whatever arnold schwarzenegger did that worked in all (laughs) 
And that's I saw one paper or, or one sort of commentary on a paper where it, they were suggesting that you can take a bit more of a shotgun approach towards hypertrophy because we're not 100% sure. Like those yeah. three mechanisms are three that have been proposed recently. Another group of researchers are suggesting that it's more about motor unit recruitment or activation. So we need to train to momentarily failure or muscle failure so that we can kind of create full activation of um, all the motor, recru- motor unit recruitments in a, in a muscle, and that would lend itself more towards hifting, lifting heavier loads, where we're going to obviously recruit more of, more of the muscle, um, and it's in, in terms of its contractile elements, or it's, yeah. it's the um, the motor units. So the way that I would I look at that is going well. Okay, there's a number of different mechanisms, and each one of those you could apply a specific type of training to. We could do things which are focused on mechanical tension, or we could do some stuff which is going to be more around exercise induced muscle damage. But the reality is, if across the course of a week, as I said before, the number one variable is, is volume. And I want to dive into some stats on that in a second. But ultimately, like if, as you said, there's a number of different things working. So let's kind of build them all in. There's, there's enough time in a week to get lots of different kind of stimuluses going, to tr- which yeah. are all going to contribute towards hypertrophy. And the one thing which we've talked about quite a bit before is you still don't get away from the fact that if you want to get strong, you need to lift heavier weights. So we might be able to get some hypertrophy um, of using 15 to 20 reps, but that's probably going to be more like endurance type muscle fibers, like your type one fibers. Those are useful for endurance, but they're not going to really help you massively in terms of, or play a, a hugely significant role in producing peak forces. So if you want to go and do a muscle up, having loads of type one fibers is not going to be as good as having more type two fibers. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and just before you dive into then the detail of these, um, of those, like talking about the mechanisms a little bit more and those volumes, just to emphasize a point, because it ties in nicely from what you said before about um, your shoulder and moving better, that whatever someone, when we're listening to this now, however you're going to sort of digest this, you cannot get away from the fact that of the simple fact that, as you said, volume is is one of the key parameters and therefore what you can manage in a week what you find interesting and what you are consistent with, that is going to be massively more important than whether you've worked out whether you're doing what percentage of your work is going to be um, metabolic stress or whether it's going to be tension or whatever it may be. Um, And the other thing would be the quality of the movement that you do is going to be reflected upon the your movement preparation beforehand and how you, how you move when you're pushing yourself. That's going to play a massive factor on how, how well you're going to progress and you're going to develop through like don't don't listen to this and sort of don't do the don't forget to do the simple things the basics getting those right getting the getting good volume in being consistent with your training and making sure that you're prepping well for those sessions and moving with good high quality um, because if you if you're not doing those things but getting like the fancy science bit right you've, you've got it the wrong way around is that fair yeah. to say Tim yeah 100 percent and I think like we can get into, we'll give you some reps and we'll talk through some of the rep ranges and variables that we've been working towards as we get through the podcast. But I think let's lay the scene out so you know you've got some context mm. as to what kind of things they might sort of fall into. And we'll try and map all this together so you've got some real takeaways from, from this conversation. But um, the other reason that I think is useful for me, and I think you and I differ quite a little bit on this one, and you might, you might differ or you might, you might beg to differ. When I've done hypertrophy training in the past, I've stuck to quite rigid variables. So I've kind of gone down the route of going eight reps, four sets, and I might do th- three or 10 reps, three sets. And I'm going to run those for a period of weeks. I might repeat them and stick within these kind of what, what originally were fairly well-defined variables, maybe like six reps, five sets, and through to sort of three sets of 10. Like, and, and you can range and play around in those. And I would have kind of previously described myself as a let's say a non-responder or a low responder in terms of hypertrophy, I find it difficult to get mm. big. And partly because I've got a lot, I've got a light frame. I'm not a big guy. Um, my, my bone mass is, is not huge. And, and there's some research which suggests around the amount of muscle building potential that you've got is directly proportional to the amount of bone mass that you've got, because there's a small frame having a ton of muscle on it. It doesn't make any sense because the bones aren't designed yeah. to handle that kind of, that kind of force production. So I've kind of feel that like I've hit my upper limits before, and I found some research which was suggesting that like volume is a real um, can be a breakthrough um, component for people who historically have been non-responders to a training stimulus, and they found it originally in endurance um, protocols where just by doing more they found they got a better 
uh, or ramping volume for the non-responders, they meant they got a better outcome. And this, they're starting to suggest that might be something in hypertrophy as well. So me doing three, oops, bang my mic, sorry, three sets of 10 um, versus me doing 10 sets of 10, like that's a massive change in volume and it could kind of break me out of this non-responder or low responder type adaptation. Um, what are your thoughts on that, Jackie? I think you're probably a better responder to resistance training than me in terms of strength and size. Um, well, I don't know. I, um, as a as a kid, was like the skinniest guy in the world. I mean, I, I weighed 10 and a half stone when I played my first game of professional rugby, which is nothing. Um, did a backwards, forward, backwards roly-poly trying to tackle somebody. And... Um, uh, but then, in terms of my experience of hypertrophy, I've not really, I've I've not really done hypertrophy training to that degree. We didn't ever, we didn't ever do that um, when I was playing rugby. Um, it was all sort of strength and power stuff. And then, uh, I probably don't find it as um, exciting post like since doing calisthenics. There's a certain level of like hypertrophy just because of some of the rep ranges working. But I've never really committed to a proper block of like right i'm gonna do that i don't think i mean i had once where i um well, i broke my foot and put on about <laughs> put on about 15 kilos of, of of eating a lot that was a big thing for for, for for hypertrophy um and just did upper body weights for rugby um but i was do we were doing a lot of like you say high tension stuff and, and high volume it was a lot of like drop sets and eccentrics um and I got massively strong and also massive. People were like, you look like you've eaten, <laughs> eaten yourself. Where's Jack? Have you eaten him? <laughs> but then I lost all that weight and that was um, that was a good project. And came back yeah, lighter. So- <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, it's a bit off task. That's all right. So the research sort of is suggesting that there's a, there's a dose response relationship, which means that effectively up until the point, and we don't really know where the upper kind of um, threshold of that is yet but the more we do from a um, sets or volume perspective the more um, hypertrophy or, or muscle development that we can expect and that's obviously not going to be infinite so don't go and start just doing 100 sets and thinking that it's a linear progression it's going to flatten yeah. out but just I've got some different so a number of different research papers so these are not all from the same paper but just some some stats to throw it out so an increase in hypertrophy from five sets compared to three sets compared to one. So if we take the biceps, and, they, and they often they'll do things on isolated muscle um, uh, isolated uh, muscle action. So if you do one set, they got a 1.6% increase in, in, in hyper, or hypertrophy or muscle mass. Three sets was 4.7%, and, and five sets was 6.9%. So significantly greater, which makes a lot of sense to as you go, right, okay, that sounds kind of fairly um, fairly logical in terms of what we know. The gains in the bicep were not as big as what we saw in the quadriceps, for example. So um, respectively, again, it was 5% improvement at one set, at one set um, 7.9% at, one, at three sets, and then 13.7% at five sets. So the more sets we're doing, the more muscle we're building, right? So yeah. volume is, is obviously a direct um, relationship with that. Now, the interesting one is when you start to get more than 10 sets. And this is this the 10 sets is taken across per muscle group over the course of a week. So it's not saying we've got to do 10 sets of an exercise every time we train they're sort of suggesting that there might be 10 to 20 sets is a good place to start across the course of a week in, and focused on, on per muscle group now we're always going to be in calisthenics be using compound movements which is basically a multi-joint pattern which is going to incorporate a lot of different muscle we're not really interested in bicep curls as an individual muscle because it's not going to help us a huge amount in terms of doing some of the stuff that we want to do. If you've got an aesthetic goal, it's a different conversation, but let's keep it within the realms of trying to do some new stuff and moving in, in different ways. Yeah. When we get a comparison of doing 10 sets per week, they showed a 9.8% improvement in hypertrophy. That was compared to doing five to nine sets per week, which gave us 6.6% improvement in hypertrophy. So evidently an improvement um, over, over having that increased dose and from a, just a bigger comparison, 10 plus sets versus five sets was a 9.8% improvement at that 10 plus and a 5.4% at that five plus. So if you go back to your old kind of like bodybuilder training session where you go, right, I'm going to do Monday is chest day. I'm not going to do chest again until next Monday, which, which obviously never happens. You do chest again on Wednesday because it's chest. <laughs> um, we can actually, by training more volume through a week, potentially double the amount of muscular hypertrophy that we can get as a result of hitting sets, those muscle groups on a more regular basis. Yeah. Yeah. I remember you talking, we were talking about that with, um, with Fran 
on uh, I don't remember the podcast off the top of yeah. my head, but Iron using body, Iron Manager using bodybuilding and and calisthenics and actually hitting those um, hitting those muscle groups again. That's why he was a big advocate of like full body uh, full body training as a as a mm. bodybuilder rather than the traditional sort of split as you were talking about. And I think it's interesting because like, if we look at a very practical example, like everyone looks at CrossFit and goes, you know, CrossFit is a jacked. They're like, <laughs> why? Well, they do a lot of work. And within their training yeah. week, they're going to have a certain amount of these three different areas of, um, of, um, uh, of, high, of the mechanisms of hypertrophy. So they're yeah. going to have some mechanical tension. They're going to be lifting heavy loads. That's going to be one, one thing which is going to start to increase muscle hypertrophy. The metabolic stress, because they do a lot at threshold in those conditioning type workouts and they are strength-based, so that's going to do something. The exercise-induced muscle damage is predominantly where we're going to bring in eccentric contractions. They're not, they don't do a huge amount of that. Um, but there's, they're, they're kind of hitting quite a lot of those, those different um, uh, mechanisms and they're also training a huge amount of volume. So as you said right at the beginning, Jack, like, there's multiple things happening at the same time. So yeah. it's not to try and move one of those out and go, that's what I want to do. We actually probably need to create an environment where we're hitting all of them. And how that applies into calisthenics is obviously different to CrossFit, but you can kind of see cases in point um, as to where people are starting to build um, bigger, bigger mass or bigger yeah. muscle mass. It's a, it's a good example actually because you go in. They're not the CrossFit. They're trying to the same thing as in guys that they're trying to achieve something. They'll have like a they're trying to do a muscle up or they're trying to do a handstand walk or they're trying to lift a certain weight so many times or whatever it may be, and they're hitting all those things as a as a result of having a some sort of training goal effectively um, rather than going right today's session I'm going to do muscle tension even though you might have an idea you might you'll talk about like using it like prolonged eccentrics on some of your the volume stuff to make that happen but that for me is a is a I personally just can get motivated and excited about a session when it's based on like an outcome rather than a almost like let the science happen by having an outcome to your training if that makes sense yeah yeah, and there's so many different ways you can mix this up. And that's where you, there's nothing wrong. Like, you can do three sets of 10, but you probably want to do those three sets of 10 more than once a week. So you, to hit those 10 to 20 sets on that muscle group, say you're doing bench press, for example, um, in, in a more kind of traditional training sense or a bodybuilding type sense, we probably want to be hitting bench maybe three or four times a week to get that attention. We might be doing flies and inclines and that sort of stuff. And obviously that very variety is, is important. And we've been doing the same thing from a calisthenics perspective of, what positions am I doing my push-ups in? Am I doing yeah. like a, um, a flat a kind of normal standard push-up? Have I got my hands on parallettes? Have I got my feet elevated? Is it more like a pipe push-up? We're starting to hit these different angles, but we're just applying the variables within that, which means that we can start to create these adaptations. Yeah. Give us some, uh, have, you got, have, you, do you want to, have you got some, jump into some um, examples. Reps and sets. Yeah. yeah. So some of the stuff. Bring it that, to life. Bring it to life. So with all that said, like I've, probably been mixing this up without too much kind of structure but more times on what what time have i got available what do i fancy doing um, and that's the beauty just, isn't it with some of these so that the, yeah. the, the, how fast you can get some of those sessions done with well i'm sure you're going to share some of those examples but they're yeah. not a lot they don't have to be long sessions that's the beauty of it yeah and definitely like you can get away with doing like yesterday i did one which was just a pull-up ladder um and it took me half an hour um because of that you choose the rest periods and stuff and i, I can chat a bit about rest because there is a bit of a, some research around that which suggests how we can maximize it but again it's it's kind of down to personal preference on what you want to do um but you could let's try and start if we start talking around um we use we talked about clusters quite a bit recently and using clusters because they're a really effective way to get volume in but you can also get intensity in and, and what's important about this is to understand that volume and intensity have got an inverse relationship you can't have high volume, lots of reps, and high intensity at the same time. And, and it's important that we understand what we mean by intensity. That's not like metabolic um, conditioning, yeah. um, tired intensity. That was a real like from a lung buster. We're talking about intensity in relation to percentage of repetition max. So let's take out your one repetition max is the most amount of weight you can perform, you can lift for one repetition. So for example, in calisthenics, that could be. You can, if you can do one pull-up, your body weight is your one RM. If you can do one pull-up with 10 kilos around your weight, waist, say take my weight of around 75 kilos, if I can do that one rep with, with 10 kilos, my one RM is 85 kilos. 
And then we scale that based on the number of repetitions we want to do. So if you're going to do 10 repetitions, and you can go and look, if you search around um, repetition max charts, you'll find the, how they kind of structure these out. And it's, again, based on some good and established literature and science that roughly around 10 repetitions, if you perform those to pretty much failure, or you can, let's, let's move away from that, you can complete the 10 repetitions, but 11 was going to be, was going to be a push. Yeah. It's going to be pretty much your 70% repetition max. If you want to go and do eight repetitions, that's pretty much going to be your 80% repetition max. And we can get quite prescriptive with training loads, but we don't necessarily need to worry about that at this instance with, with what we're talking about with the volume because it kind of takes care of itself. Apart from one of the examples, which was a cluster approach where you're actually going to try and choose a repetition max variable. So we're going to try and go, um, say I want to do eight reps. I want to try and do nine reps at my eight rep max. And that sounds a bit like confusing because you just I just said you've got to do eight reps and no more. <laughs> but what we do with the cluster is we just build in into set rest periods. So I'm going to go and take my nine reps and I'm going to try and I'm going to, I'm going to use a weight which I can do eight repetitions of. Sorry, I need to go back a pedal on this one. So my first thing to do is I'm going to test, let's take dips. How much weight can I put around my waist and do eight dips? So let's, for argument's sake, let's say that's 20 kilos. I'm then going to go and take 20 kilos and I'm going to go and do five reps. I'm going to take a 10 second rest. And then I'm going to do two more reps and take a 10 second rest. So I've got seven now. Another 10 second rest, two more. That gives me nine. So all of a sudden I've taken an extra rep on that I wouldn't have normally been able to do if I did eight reps in one sitting. And I've managed to maintain a decent level of intensity. So it's almost like I bag myself an extra free rep at a good level of intensity, which is going to start to elicit that a hypertrophy adaptation does that make sense yeah yeah and it's, that all right? yeah yeah and it's uh it makes me just think of that that progressive overload that people that we've had um uh who, what's the i'm gonna forget his name now pt phil coach Lerner. phil learner yeah he 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 really like hammered that home in a really beautiful way of going like applying that to every aspect of life effectively but here they're in training going this is I'm, and this resonates with me because it's something that i've tried to probably do poorly in the past is like try and take like two bigger jumps rather than going like do you know what, i've just got this attitude of like oh, i was able to do one more rep it's like well let's try and do two more rather than no no like in a in a week's time or a couple weeks time like add that additional one but that's the that's one of the things i like about this plus is you're just nudging just one rep and it's like a it's a good it's a good level of of progressive overload just in that small little set effectively let alone yeah. what's going to happen week by week and within that, if we go back to a hypertrophy adaptations and let's talk broadly about those three mechanisms that we, we talked about before, we're going to get some mechanical tension there. And if we build in the eccentric as well, we're going to yeah. get some of that exercise induced muscle damage as well. So I've been really strict with going, I'm going to do these on a four second eccentric. And it, it like it's like tempo is breaks you. Like it is that I, I refer to it as a silent assassin of the, of the variables because no one pays enough attention to it. And it will be the one thing which buries you. If you think you're good at lifting, or training, you don't you, you don't focus on trying to do tempos properly, down to a two second eccentric or a four second eccentric. I promise you, you can you can feel like you're a complete beginner again by just doing that one thing. So people at home in lockdown mm. go, I can't train properly. I've got no weights. I can't I can't overload. Just do tempo, and it will bury you. Mate, we used to have a, like our old coach. You know, we had, we had Joe Brun on the on the podcast a while ago. Pre season was always the same, like starting point of like bedding that foundation in, and particularly when when like new players signed and no one was used to doing it, he made you do. You only had, you had to do sets of four reps, but it was a five second eccentric and a five second concentric. So it was just a constant moving rep. So you worked for forty seconds without stopping, and it was flipping brutal. Um, and what those four reps equated effectively to what you could do for ten if you were allowed to go at your own pace. Like it just, mm. you know, not only was that I did that had the concentric in as well, but it was it's a like you say it's an app. It just it buries you. One thing that one thing I like about a slow controlled eccentric, this is not hypertrophy sort of gains, but is the fact that it allows you to be super mindful and like conscious of your movement and making sure that it is really high quality and you are keeping your shoulders in good positions and that type of stuff. It does lend itself to that well. 
Tim Ferriss wrote a book about using that tactic, which was a four hour body, which was basically that five second up, five second down, because some of the science around hypertrophy was that you needed to get 40 seconds of time under tension for a, mm. for a muscle to grow. And, and again, that's been some kind of like challenge. Is it 30 seconds or 60% seconds? Yeah. It doesn't really matter. There isn't a magic bullet in that one. What we know is that by increasing the time under tension is going to create at a high enough intensity or an appropriate intensity yeah. is going to create some form of hypertrophy. So, we need to have those eccentric contractions in there and it will lend itself towards the increased, uh, the, the muscle damage type mechanism of, um, of extending that eccentric. But I, I've, I've really actually sadistically quite enjoyed it. Because <laughs> Punishing it's, yourself. Uh, well, yeah, it's just, um, I it's don't know, the it's very satisfying. It? It's the, the it. satisfying pump. <laughs> it's not even the, it's not even the pump. It's almost just like, I find the satisfaction in that I am training properly. Yeah. yeah, it feels like with this sort of stuff for the first time, maybe in my life, I've, I have played around with it before, but um, for a long time where I feel, particularly around capacity strength, that I'm not just allowing gravity yeah. to do the work just for sort me. Of aimlessly busting reps out. Of it. The other yeah. thing is people, a lot of, you know, handstand push-ups or the frog to handstand, obviously a very popular movement that people want to get. I always say that you need to be able to move slowly, have strength moving slowly because you can't move quick enough in a handstand push-up in a frog tanzan because you lose your balance. Mm-hmm. So actually having this as part of, as an element to your your training or one of the one of the uh, bits of your your sort of training diet is is going to be helpful for that um, because it's 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 different when you have to move slowly. The strength mm-hmm. requirement. With that strength-based cluster, like I'm probably looking just for people's reference and answer all the questions, we, you've obviously defined your intensity by, by establishing what your repetition max is before you begin the first set. You've got your reps and sets. And again, if we're going to try and pack some volume in for the amount of work we're going to try and do, like I, I'm kind of doing on these, on those kind of um, sets at the moment, I'm doing like five, five sets of those, but you could get away with less if you're going to repeat them a number of times during the week. And then this comes down to, as Jack had made the point before, of how you can recover is really important. Yeah. And before we get carried away and you guys switch off and run out and start doing a ton of volume, we are going to talk about periodization before we close this podcast out um, and how we're going to deload because you cannot get away with just absolutely spanking this week yeah. in, week out. But five is, a, five is a good uh, is a good middle ground number for people. Like one less would obviously be four. You could away be what, like, you wouldn't probably go much more than like, would you go much more than six? No, I think you get. You've probably had enough. You probably find you that at that point you're going to lose quality. Yeah. Like you're going to. Have, I think it's as well. Like I would often. Uh, I am often allowing the intensity to govern how much work I think I can do. So if I get to my fourth set and I've rather I've rather than got a decision to make, is that enough for that muscle mm. or movement pattern for that day, or am I going to make a change because I can't continue to move well, which could be dropping the weight down? To be honest, I'm probably going to come back at it and do another day, yeah. potentially. Um, and I'd probably go about at least two and a half minutes between sets on those. Two minutes, two and a half minutes. Um, the, the rest period research is suggesting that with the upper body, you can get away with a bit less. Mm. The lower body needs more. Um, but so, yeah, shorter rest periods on the upper body. But um, again, I'm sort of thinking that I need at least 60 seconds. And, and again, it depends on which literature you look at, up to around two minutes. Um, and if I'm really kind of like if you're going hard, if intensity is high, say you're trying to do this, this technique with like a six RM and you've got a real, that means you're using like a real high intensity load or much higher then you might want to go for a slightly longer rest up to about three minutes. But there is again, no magic bullet. Um, and I've, I've been kind of manipulating rest periods to allow me to continue to maintain tempo and intensity because if my rest is short, one of those is going to have to compromise as a result. You can't have it all, all the time. Yeah. So that rest is almost related to, um, that intensity that you're talking about of one RM, that if you're if you're lower down towards your sort of five six reps of towards more towards your max strength, then you need to have sort of more max strength rest periods, and if you're going higher, then you can afford to have yeah. more like your sort of sixty ninety seconds rest. Because there's no point being dead like rigid on your rest and then rocking up and not being able to finish a set with same <laughs> yeah. intensity. Like you just you, you cut your nose off to spite your face. Um, so that's one of the, the other one I've been, I enjoy, which is a kind of works as quite a nice finisher. Actually, this one works quite well with quite simple movements. Um, uh, so I use it a lot on horizontal push and pull. So push ups and rows, um, four reps, 10 sets with a 10 second rest in between. So you're basically just going to go four reps. And again, with these ones, I've been building in the eccentric of about four seconds as well, which makes the challenge, um, a whole lot more, um, difficult. And then you, t- you literally sit your bum on the ground or put your knees down, do a 10 second rest. And then you're going to go again and you're just going to repeat that 10 times. So you do 40 reps in what is probably going to take you about four, four and a half minutes. 
um, depending on what your tempos are you're mm. going to use. And you just that's one of the points you made before, Jacko, is like, if you do that, you've put 10 sets in, if you've done it at a decent intensity from and, um, and you've controlled your tempo, that'll take you four and a half minutes, and you've just done a great little bit of stimulus yeah. for whatever pattern you're working on. It doesn't need to be a 90-minute session. Well, you say you do, you do that on a push and then a pull. You've done a 10-minute session because you had a minute rest in between yeah. those two things, and you're like, boom, shanker, you're away. Yeah, yeah, Go yeah, back yeah. And exactly. Half an hour in, warm up, do both of those, like kind of have a drink or whatever yeah and um yeah you know it doesn't need to be that long and, and this th- that is that would probably lend itself more towards type like yes we're going to get some exercise induced muscle damage because we're going to control the eccentric but you're going to be doing more around metabolic metabolic stress in that because the intensity is going to be less because the rest period is lower and therefore you are just going to be starting to build up these um like the the, the metabolic with the waste products and we're doing some there's some occlusion happening and basically getting some cell swelling within that we, we don't want to get into the mechanisms of that today but effectively we are creating an adaptation which can can lead to an anabolic effect on the muscle mm-hmm. as a result of having this kind of like this yeah, hydrogen ion build up and etc which is just gonna yeah that's what feels a bit grotty and, and it's what that tends to make people feel like that that metabolic stress is what often people would refer to as the pump and you finish those sessions and you just feel flipping muscles are swollen and because that's the kind of adaptation we've got as opposed to doing a more strength-based workout where you might come away from it not feeling as pumped up but you haven't you've been doing more kind of like mechanical like tension type yeah. work yeah yeah i think the nice thing i think of the those types of sessions are like they're a great tool to have in your toolbox to go i'm not feeling like i'm not feeling that great today um, I'm, I'm choosing, I could just have a rest day, but I'm choosing to do, because I want to do something for whatever reason, but actually that's going to be a quite simple one for me to like just cram in a decent amount of work with intensity, but a short amount of time um, and and feeling feeling good about it because I've, I've achieved something at the end of it. Um, and or it could be, I know for me, I like to try and do um, like at the beginning of the week, my sort of harder stuff and then by the end of the week, I need some easier type of sessions. And actually, you know, you're going to talk about periodization, but a little bit of like undulation, like during the week of like a session like that is, is good for me when it, when I want to, you know, I want, I want to, I want to do a bit of a push pull session, but I don't want to actually hammer myself because what I'm planning on in three days time is like a really good handstand or muscle up session or something. So on some work, but I don't want to like, go hard out because I'm actually planning on doing quite a, a harder sort of higher intensity in terms of like more of a max strength power type session say with handstand push-ups or muscle-ups and I don't want to jeopardize yeah. that late for later in the or the following week or that do you know what I mean towards yeah. towards the end of the week I want a little bit of an easier session yeah, so absolutely. I think it fits in well there yeah and, and we can kind of contrast that like large giant set if you want to call that in terms of the number of rep uh, sets that we're going to do we're like we've talked about 10 sets with that example with what german volume training would traditionally be be um would be the same thing 10 reps 10 sets again for the sadists in there we try and put in a four second eccentric if we can but honestly depending <laughs> depending on how conditioned you are for that kind of volume at the intensities that we're aiming at that that eccentric is brutal mm-hmm. um and we would pro- probably within that we'd be then falling within the, the to, or reverting more to the traditional volumes that, um, of reps and, that we've been um, using historically from a literature perspective of six to 10, potentially. And we might choose one of those and we might go, right, I'm going to do eight reps, 10 sets. Um, and that's what I did the other week. Uh, if anyone has seen it on Instagram, which was around elevated hands and feet, pipe push ups, four second eccentric, eight reps, 10 sets. That's and it was like, heroic. Yeah, I didn't. I didn't think I was going to be able to do it. I'd done eight the week before. I'd done eight reps for eight. And I went, I'm going to go 10 for 10. So it's 20 more reps that I needed to do. And, um, and got them out. And that's where you go, right, and my shoulder didn't hurt through any of that. Mm. Um, I'm like, okay, so now we're actually doing something. I couldn't lift my arms up afterwards. I mean, was, uh, <laughs> that good was felt epic. <laughs> <laughs> we remember when I was like, when we was first started going to the gym and I was like 16, we were away from school. And it was like, it was, it was a great session when you like really were struggling to hold onto the steering wheel to drive home because you were that arms were that bombs. You couldn't lift them yeah. up. We used to do one where session. if you've been doing biceps, you couldn't go home until you literally couldn't like flex your elbow and then touch your own shoulder. You know that feeling where your bicep is so swollen that you <laughs> yeah, can't actually bend your elbow and touch your shoulders. That's that the was one. home time. Yeah. Um, so that's like a bit of a mindset session as well. Um, getting in amongst that is a bit of an interesting one. And again, like this, these are, let's. I want to do German volume training, so I've got to do 10 sets. You haven't, just like as we, as we talked about today, 
the volume is the key driver. So if you want to start playing around with some of the stuff and do six sets, then that's cool. Just try and get that in twice a week and you're going to start to hit those volumes that we're talking about of more than 10 sets per muscle group per week. And also throw it all again in the mix as well. As if you go and do something on pull-ups and then you're also doing a horizontal pull session during the week on bodyweight rows, well, lats are working both of those just slightly differently. But it's not like it's a, they're, they're different muscle groups. They're both, of, both the trapezius and the lats are going to be working within both those patterns. So they are both getting stimulated just in different variations. And then that's helping because it's going to build hypertrophy across the muscle through a different range of movement, which is going to build up to something again a little bit more substantial from the adaptation we're looking for. So you can kind of mix it up and don't get pigeonholed or, or like um, rigid on one thing. Bring the variety, play around with some of this stuff. And and I made a point, and I know you'll have something to say about this one, Jacko, around yeah. tracking training. Like this sort yeah. of volume when you're doing it is so important because it's, you're doing so much, it's so easy to forget what you've done. Yeah, no, I think that's something, um, I was thinking about this in the shower this morning when I knew we were going to be doing this podcast. It's something that I've been slack at in the past and got no excuse because I've got a number of different um, scorecards and it's di- training diaries on the go that keep various different notes in. But I've got one that is there. Um, well, I was, it's actually, it's, it start, I started tracking stuff better because I was initially actually tracking things not to do with training. I was tracking um, my what I was eating and what my digestive system was working out. I was tracking um, heart waking heart rate and a few other things purely based on like I was trying to make some health changes for the sort of current lockdown situation. And actually that has then led into then while well, I started recording my training a bit more specifically. Um, and like you said, when you're doing some stuff like this, for me, one of the biggest things is I did a session the other day and I was buzzing off the back of it because I'd done um, I'd done sort of like a bit of a giant set on uh, a bit of a pyramid on um, pull ups, but I'd done like a significant or I'd done a great amount, like more than I'd done the week before, and I just felt great because I'd done more than I than I'd done the week before, and I was reflecting afterwards, and only because I'd written if I'd have not written it down and like when I when I sat down and wrote down right this is what I did this session and looked at it compared to the last like I knew in black and white there in front of me and it it gave me that extra feeling of like I knew I'd already I knew my I knew without looking at the numbers that I'd done better but it just had a different effect on me and when I was reflecting back I thought if I'd have never written this down what I'd have done in the past was I'd have been like yeah that was that session yeah no session was all right yeah uh but and like because I'd wouldn't actually like have that great a gauge of like exactly what I'd done in compared to a previous week or a previous month. And my thing that I would do is I'd, I'd probably downplay the session and be like, yeah, I probably didn't actually do that much. I, I probably could have done more and then try and do more or, or whatever, just mm-hmm. do something else the next day rather than going like, no, no, you like, you did a great session there. And actually the week before you hadn't touched on those, on those bar muscle ups for a whole week and like that's why it was so good because you did a great session and then you didn't mess about with it again. You let yourself recover. You did your other bits and pieces and then you came back to it fresh. Um, so tracking things for me is, is I sound like an idiot probably saying it because I, I like it's it's one of those it's like of course, but you know we all fall into sort of bad habits and I mentally for a long time really really didn't want to track stuff. I just mm-hmm. wasn't in the headspace for it and so and so I didn't. But I'm now now there and uh, and definitely reaping the benefits of it as you say it's that key to that progressive overload if i know what yeah. i did last week i know what i've got to do this week and last week i did eight so this week i've got to do 10 and yeah. then that shows that i'm getting stronger and I'm, I'm, I'm ramping that stimulus the whole time um and the last one that i'll just go through that i've been um playing around with and this one's probably like a little bit less scientific but it's quite fun um it's just a big old pyramid and it's a I've got, you go 10 9 8 7 6 5 4 3 2 1 and then if you want to you can then go 2 3 4 5 6 7 8 9 10 back up if you do that whole ladder up and down you get 99 reps in but what i like about it is it's interesting the volume changes you get a little bit more rest as you go through so it's not like doing 10 sets of 10 on a pull-ups which is going to give you 100 reps if I do the ladder, I might still get 99 reps of a, of a pull-up, but because I go 10 and it's a bit easier, get 9 and then 8, and then all of a sudden down my sort of 3, 2, 1 region, I'm kind of getting a little bit more recovery time, which is going to help me to come back up the ladder. 
Now, the flip side to that, because it's never always black and white, is if you really wanted to, you could actually change your intensity as you got closer down to those ones. So you could go, let's say, for example, you go body weight 10 pull-ups. By the time you're hitting reps three or two or one, you might be putting five kilos around your waist or a little bit of additional load to try and get some more um, stimulus of those strength-based adaptations. But that's why I'm, I'm enjoying playing around with some of this stuff is because you've always got variables which you can manipulate. You can change your rest periods a little bit. I can add some load on. I'm going to choose to do heart or like all the way down the ladder but not go back up. I'm feeling good. I'm going to go back up. Like yesterday was an example of that. I'd done the live in the morning and I went, I'd trained quite consistently and I thought I felt pretty good when I started. But I started doing my pull-ups and I was going to try and do the full ladder up and down. And I got down to like rep six or set six and I was like, I've not got it today. So I just finished off at one because I knew that I was never going to get back up the other way because of too much fatigue in the system. So um, just another little thing to try, play around with them. And um, and hopefully that's just going to give you a little bit of uh, food for thought for just bringing some volume in, getting specific adaptation. We're, we're talking kind of large around her hypertrophy. But for most people, like, don't be afraid of thinking that, oh, if I start doing this work, I'm going to get massive. Like, look at me. It's, it's not that easy to get huge. Like, it's just capacity strength at the end of the day. And most of us will benefit from having a little bit more um, lean tissue, which is going to help us to move and produce force in, in, um, in the, the, the bigger calisthenics patterns that we're working towards. Yeah, definitely. And that's and I think that's where probably stark contrast to any, when, everyone, when anyone sees the term hypertrophy or thinks we're talking about hypertrophy, it gets the, the tendency to think that it's based on aesthetics, whereas actually, you know, as school rule number, I don't know if it's school number, no, school rule number one is don't, don't get hurt, isn't it? School two, yeah. don't, get, don't arrested. get arrested. School three is it's more important. Like we, it's more important what you can do with your body than how it looks. So this is you're doing this as a your rationale for doing this is bigger muscles create more force. I'm trying to do something that um, I need more force capacity or ability to be able to produce more force, and therefore that's why I'm trying to generate some some larger muscle. That's why I'm trying to elicit uh, so a hypertrophy response rather than. I uh, just, I want to get big and I want to look because I'm insecure about how I look. Um, yeah, the other thing about that though so, is like, as we've talked a lot of science and rationale today, but the other thing that's easy for me is it's mindless. Like, I know what I've got to do. I can, I can just get into it. It's not, and, and I'm, I'm typically doing two exercises per session and it might take me an hour because of what I'm doing with tempos and rest periods and, and prep and whatever. But I might just go horizontal push and pull. And once I know what, what the variables I'm going to use, I just crack on with it. I haven't got to sort of like, it's not technical work. Um, and for where I'm at at the moment, that is just being an absolute lifesaver and helping me to get through training sessions, and I'm and I'm properly enjoying it. But that, yeah, and there's no. Uh, that's like such a plays such a vital role in all of this. You, if you you can get all these things right, and some of those touched on some of those things right at the beginning, going like you know, if you aren't actually being consistent and you're not doing you know you're not doing the simple things right and getting that volume right, the the the, in, the nitty gritty of the stuff that we've been talking about since then, um, you know, it all goes out the window really. If you if you're not if you aren't able to get yourself in the right headspace, and if this is allowing you to get in a good headspace with your training and and therefore be more consistent, then that's going to play a huge role in you getting more results and more more gains or insane yeah. gains. Maybe do you know what I mean? <laughs> it's true though, right? So it's, like it is true. Yeah, yeah, hundred percent. Like more more training means that we're going to <laughs> yeah. get more adaptation and that probably brings us quite nicely onto the point around um loading and or more to the point of deloading um and i think the important takeaway message from this is that we've got to be strict or disciplined around how we are going to schedule deload weeks or have periods of time where volume is lower you cannot spank 10 20 sets of every of every muscle group doing some of this stuff week in week out for the next six months and not expect something to blow up because you're doing high tension movements, high intensity, um, and a lot of volume through the system. So you, it has to, I would only kind of recommend that people start playing around with some of this training and, and committing to it for a period of months, which is what it takes to, to really kind of get meaningful adaptation. We're not talking about doing it for two weeks. If you have already got to the point where you are comfortable taking a deload week. Yeah, no, you know that you uh, you know, I'm the guy that finds it difficult to do the two load week. We um, enjoy training, but it's yeah. like you, you've got to offset that and, and understand that you are not going to lose everything that you've done in 
in the, the space of seven days. Um, and you've got to find a way to be able to actually maintain some level of sanity if you struggle with it. Of What what can you do during an off yeah, week? Finding some other stuff. There must, yeah, there's like a ton of stuff. And it might be to do with training. Like it might be more you want to work on some more mobility stuff or some stretch or whatever it may be. But it also might be like something you've wanted to, like what else have you wanted to do in life? And you go, mm. oh, I've got this book I want that bought ages ago that I want to read or I want to do this or I want to do that. Well, like, just could prioritize with some of those other things that week. Um, yeah. And you can do some maintenance work, right? We schedule that into our virtual classroom programs yeah. every fourth week is a deload. And what we're doing there is just dropping some of the volume out there. So we might still use some of the exercises like a pull up, but rather than doing 10 sets or doing six sets or five sets or whatever, we might just go and do one. And it, or, what you're doing there is reminding the brain that the intensity or we still need that strength. So don't, don't do anything with it. Just leave mm. it there because I'm still, I'm reminding you that it's, it's still relevant in my, need to move and survive um so there is a structure around those deload weeks um that, where you don't have to stop training but you've got to drop the volume down to let the net benefit be recovery rather than fatigue yeah, um, yeah definitely. and then just my last point on this one was like as i said a good place to start if you want to start to, uh, messing around with some of this stuff is aim for sort of 10 to 20 sets per week per muscle group but we, we'll probably take that in calisthenics of being per movement pattern and you're broadly going to put those into horizontal push and pull vertical push and pull and lower body um, and how you're going to mix those things in together is, is kind of how you want to stretch your training program throughout the week how long your sessions are going to be how often you want to train all that sort of stuff but with all the ways we kind of say do something monitor it see how you get on adapt it as you go learn from the from the process um, and have some fun with it and just challenge yourself and see like yeah just play around with those those reps and those rest periods and tempos and stuff and you're going to find a whole world of training for most people that you've probably not explored before yeah it's giving yourself options isn't it and and, and uh as you say try some of these things out see what and that ultimately because tim's suggesting like you find out what works for you but then when you do find out something that works for you it's not that isn't like i'm going to train like this then for the rest of my life they need we need to go through these you know, a little bit of periods of like changing our training stimulus so that we actually um, give ourselves some times of like higher intensity work, sometimes like you're doing now going like actually some some building some muscle. So going through a periodization of sort of building some muscle mass that's going to like give me a little bit more force that I'm going to then, then apply that into some like, I'm, I'm assuming you're going to then go into some some more max strength stuff to work on some of the things that you want to do in calisthenics that requires more maximal strength as, as an output so it's part of a journey rather than this is just all right this is me for the rest of my life because all that happens is the body gets used to the the stimulus you're placing upon it and so we need to we need to ultimately like make things mix things up i just remember guys played with these mix mix it up keep the body guessing but and it was like a bit of a joke but at the same time there's there is actually some some real essence to that eh? yeah it depends how big i get because if i get really big <laughs> then i probably just keep doing this <laughs> oh, so, so after all that it is about getting big <laughs> oh, i don't know you teed that one up it was too easy but no there's definitely going to be some stuff going forwards with this i mean like yeah. um yeah we'll see where it goes i haven't sort of decided what what that looks like in the future yet but um it's uh, it, i'm having fun with it and just yeah i wanted to share some of that with with everybody else and see yeah. if they uh, if they want to get some some of this in their program as well right, another thing my last point and i will shut up today i feel like i've talked a lot today sorry um is one thing which is making a massive difference for me in terms of accountability on this is having um, i've got a, um, a watch a, a garmin tracking watch but it's got a, it's got a strength based setting on it which you can get on any stopwatch but it's basically a lap function so i put my reps in and as soon as i finish the set click the button to get my lap and then i'm then going to go and use that as my rest period counter and if i set myself a target of a 90 second rest like i'm going at 90 um, yeah. and it, that has been an absolute game changer for me and again it's like what you said before jack about writing stuff down it's so obvious but i've let that slip um, yeah. whereas oh, is that about a minute? I don't know. Actually, do you know what it is? It's not it's like about <laughs> five minutes that you've just been stood around not doing anything. Um, and it just means you get through a lot of work, especially when you've got more work, more volume to get into a session. You've got to be a little bit more efficient. Yeah, no, definitely. I've done, I, I went to, I'll just tee it up for a potential another one. Like the, some of the stuff I've been doing has been a little bit more conditioning based and therefore like timing stuff is, in, is like doing stuff on the minute and that type of work or every two minutes or whatever it may be. But as you say, there's times we can go fast by and we'll talk, we can talk about that in another, 
Um, so there's a part two to in this. A, then. Another, well, yeah, it's, 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 we'll, we'll t- call it like conditioning rather than just sort of, there's going to be some listing, some hypertrophy response, but it's a little bit more, yeah, conditioning based. As I, as I said at the beginning, more a little bit like what Andrew Tracy was talking about. Um, and uh, yeah, no, we'll talk, we can talk about that on, uh, on another podcast, another episode. Marvelous. But similar type, similar type of things, but just going for a little bit more conditioning work. Yeah. 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 Different adaptation. And that's, yeah. Just again, it's understanding how to manipulate your variables so you can get the adaptation that you want. It's the key to it all. Perfecto. Right. I'm all out, Jacko. I've exhausted myself today. <laughs> it's good. <laughs> Has anyone made it to the end with this? Hopefully I don't know. I felt like that. If I, I felt like I spoke a bit quick today, that was rattling through. So I hope you're taking notes. Well, no, I think that's the that's the that's the one of the important things that we that we are. Um, other, yeah, taking notes. I think one thing I was just going to say before we sign off is going. You might be in a really good block of work that you're doing right now, and we're going. Oh, yes, you, you need to try this and change this, and do. Mm-hmm. you're like, write it down. Like you have this in your in your locker of like when you've come to the end of the block of work that you're doing that's working really well for you at the moment you're ready for then a change well then then maybe sort of use i'm not i don't want yeah. people to get carried away and go like right tomorrow i've got to do a cluster set because tim that's what tim was doing and, and i want to be like tim um and it might be yeah have a go at it tomorrow but it might be that you're in a block of work and you're looking for something different or it might be that you're in a block of work you're doing a real great job and uh, this needs to be something you yeah you make a note of it Obviously, the podcast is up there on the on the on the website. You can visit it and re-listen to it anytime you want. But if you make a few notes, there's key points, um, and then and then use some of those next time that you're looking for some sort of variation to just change that stimulus. Perfect. Well said. Let's do it. Should we wrap it up. That's the end. Yeah. Right. Until next time. Well, I just want to make sure everyone gives us a nice review at the end of the end of the. Uh, I just realised I said that as like it's more, isn't it? <laughs> Why don't just if, yeah, get, yeah, if forgot just, to hold the show. Look at um, some of those five star reviews. A lot of you have been listening. We're getting so many people saying they're listening, to, uh, sharing, and we love it. Like, thank you for for listening and you and, and sharing those on stories. Uh, those that do that and tagging us in, and we love uh, seeing that. And glad that everyone is. Um, enjoying it and getting a lot of value out of the the podcast and the guests that we've had on as well and even when we don't have guests like this um but not everyone's been and give us a review because if we'd have like thousands of reviews if people had uh, also done a review so get on and do give us a little review please should i do it now jacko yeah until next time class dismissed so thank you so much again for listening. We don't take it lightly that you uh, give up probably an hour of your time to listen to these podcasts, and so we really do appreciate that. We hope you got a load of value out of it, guys, and we would, if you did, we would love you to do a couple of things for us. One of them is tell us other people and share it if you thought that we were adding some value, and also if you want to, pop over to iTunes or wherever you're listening to this and give us a five-star review. We like five stars. Four stars not as good keep it five, five are the best five of your best stars please <laughs> and if you would like to find out more about the school of calisthenics and see the best of everything that we have got head over to our virtual classroom you can access it from the website at school of and that is where we have got literally possibly the best calisthenics resource available anywhere in the world it's definitely the best one we've done and on that note until next week class dismissed <laughs>